My name's Abby, and I work on putting a mo Mars rover onto Mars. So I'm going to give you a very potted history of why we want to put a, a rover on Mars and what the mission is all about. I only have 10 minutes, so it's going to be pretty brief. I can literally talk about this for sort of days straight, so I'm going to have to rein myself in a little bit because there's some really exciting people coming after me who I'm sure you also want to hear from tonight, unfortunately, for me. <laughs> um, so we want to put a, a rover on Mars. Well, there's already some there, you could tell me. Well, yes, there are. But we want to put another one there because Mars is really exciting. Um, so. Why Mars? Well, Mars is in the Goldilocks zone of planets. It's not too hot and it's not too cold. And there's enough energy there that life could still exist, or at least might have existed in the past. It's very geologically interesting. It's quite similar to Earth in its chemical makeup. And therefore, it's also really close by cosmic terms. Um, it's really the easiest and the most likely place for us to find life if it was in our solar system. So that's what we're looking for, life. So we don't intend, well, we'd love to, but uh, we don't expect to find little green men on Mars. Um, that would be really very exciting. Um, but I think if they were there, we'd probably already know about them. So when we talk about life on Mars, we're talking about bugs. Um, at best, possibly just bits of amino acid or something like that. Um, but equally, we'll be very, very excited about that. It does answer one of our big questions, really. Are we alone in the universe? So that's what this mission is really all about. So one of the big things that you might have seen in the last few weeks, uh, NASA announced that they've found water on Mars. Don't get too excited, NASA. We've known that there's water on Mars. Uh, for well over a decade now. Uh, these are the missions that have added to our evidence of water on Mars. And actually, it was a European mission that finally confirmed once and for all that there was actual water on Mars uh, back in 2005. So get with the program, guys. That's been a decade now. Um, however, uh, we found different evidence for water with all of these missions. Uh, we actually found hydrated minerals, which is what they found precisely at the surface of Mars with our 2005 European mission. But, you know, don't want to bang that drum too many times. Um, but you can see evidence here. So the blue on this image that you can see at the bottom is subsurface hydrogen in a water analogous state, um, if you're interested. Uh, that means it's probably water. Uh, but it's hydrogen under the surface that may or may not be attached with two of them together with an oxygen. Um, then there's some disappearing bright material that was found uh, by Phoenix, which was a little lander with a scoop on it. So it scooped some soil, did some tests, and then turned around again, and the scooped hole didn't look the same as it used to look. And they think that's because there was some kind of ice, it could have been carbon dioxide, it could have been water, um, that sublimated or evaporated uh, in the time that it was doing its science with its little sample. And then, last week, NASA got all excited because they saw this. So these are recurring slope lineae, um, and they disappear in the cold winter, and they reappear during the summer and they streak down the hills from outcrops of rock. And we've learned from looking at these with lots of different instruments and lots of different missions that they have these perchlorates in the surface. Um, so we're looking at sodium perchlorate, magnesium perchlorate, um, and also magnesium uh, chloride. And these salts are seeping down the hills uh, when it gets to about minus 70 degrees centigrade. And that is the kind of thing uh, that suggests to us that it's, it's liquid, it's water, it's flowing down the surface. Uh, and when it gets to about those temperatures, those salts in the water, just like if you put salt on the roads in the winter, uh, it decreases the freezing temperature sufficiently that this could be liquid water at the surface. Now, this 
gets very interesting for reasons that I don't have time to get into, uh, but due to planetary protection, that means that we can't go and look at them. Um, but we're not going to talk about that tonight. Ask me afterwards. So, designing a Mars rover. That's what we're all here to talk about. How do you do it? Well, Mars is really, really, really cold. So in the summer, at night, it gets down to about minus 70 degrees, but in the winter, it can be minus 130. But it also fluctuates dramatically from day to night. So you're talking about temperature fluctuations of 70 degrees over the course of a day, where here on Earth, you'd fluctuate by maybe a maximum of 20 degrees. So that's pretty challenging from a structural perspective. I'm the structures engineer on the project, so unfortunately, that's my problem. Um, it's also dusty, you've got to land. We're used to putting missions into space and it's all nice and floaty and microgravity-like. We don't like to land. Um, so that's a problem. Um, and then planetary protection, which I kind of alluded to, which basically means we can't contaminate Mars with Earth bugs. If we're looking for life on Mars, the last thing we want to do is go and, go and contaminate that environment, seed it with Earth life so that we or future missions find life there and don't know whether it's come from Earth or not. So we have to make sure that all of the missions that we send are very, very sterile, um, so that we're not going to contaminate Mars for ourselves or for future missions. So this is our Mars rover design. Um, the big exciting thing that you've got on here that... Have I got a pointer? Oh, I've got a pointer. Um, is this. We're really excited about this, and I'm going to tell you why we're excited about this. Uh, but just so that you get a brief idea, we've got six wheels, fairly standard Mars rovery kind of things, solar powered, completely so solar powered, unlike the uh, NASA missions, which have a lump of plutonium um, giving them most of their power. And you've got a head on the top of a mast with cameras at the top here so that you can see where you're going and drive around autonomously. So, the exciting thing. This is our drill. And this is the thing that we're most, exciting, most excited about packing uh, in our little suitcase for Mars. So, the reason that you want to drill is so that you can get samples from underneath the surface. But the danger of having a drill and drilling it down into the surface is what if there's something under the surface that might break your drill, or you might get stuck in. So before we get to the exciting drill, we have to take a moment and decide that we're going to put ground-penetrating radars on so that we can see what's below the surface, so that we know where to drill and where not to drill. We also need a camera so that we can find where we want to drill in the first place. And then we can think about the drill. So this is the first time that we've taken a really, really big drill to another planet, and we're talking a really, really big drill. You can pile down two meters below the surface of Mars with our drill. Um, so that's significantly taller than I am below the Mars surface. And the reason that you want to do that is because the surface of Mars, as you can probably tell from seeing the Martian movie, if anyone did that, um, it's pretty hostile to life. You don't really want to live there. It's pretty nasty. So you've got a lot of UV radiation uh, coming from the sun. You've got cosmic radiation, which penetrates a lot deeper than that. And you've got the, the perchlorates that NASA found at the surface. Now, perchlorates are great uh, because they might mean that there's liquid water, but they also really suck for finding life. Um, and the problem with that is that they're quite strong oxidants. So all of the ways that we look for life at the moment tend to involve getting a little sample, baking it, and seeing what comes off it, uh, sniffing it with a spectrometer or something like that. Unfortunately, you have any perchlorates in that sample, and you heat it, and anything that's basically got carbon in it oxidizes, and you wouldn't be able to recognize it as life even if it used to be. So in, in the act of looking for life, you destroy it. <laughs> so that's lovely. Um, so we need to get down to below where these perchlorates exist. And the perchlorates, a lot of chemistry that we won't get into because I'm a structures engineer and anyway, I only have 10 minutes, um, are basically caused by a process at the surface of 
sand and oxygen, uh, sorry, atmosphere interacting with each other and causing these perchlorates. So if you can get down into the bedrock where there's no sand, where there's no mobile particles, you get down below these oxidants and these perchlorates. So two metres below the surface, you get uh, one in four million of the radiation that you get at the surface. So that's pretty good. Um, you can get down to the bedrock, so you can avoid these oxidants. And radiation is shielded, it's light. So if you're just under a single layer of sand, you're not going to get sunburn. So uh, that's pretty good for life as well. So that's what we're really excited about taking our drill for. But then we have to go somewhere exciting to science. And Mars is a really long way away. So depending on where the planets are, it can be up to 24 minutes signal delay to get to Mars. So if you're driving a Mars rover by, via remote control, that takes a really long time to do anything interesting. That's a really dull job. Nobody wants that job. Well, they kind of do, because you're driving a Mars rover around, for Christ's sake. <laughs> um, but equally, you can do a lot more science with the life that you've got there uh, with your rover if you can drive around autonomously. So that's what our rover's going to do. We're going to be able to give it a destination from the maps that we've got from our orbiting satellites of Mars. And we're going to say, OK, this place looks interesting scientifically. It can be up to two days' drive away, not within the rover's field of sight or anything like that. And our rover will be able to work out where it is, what's in front of it, pick a path through the terrain in front of it, and get to that science destination, and then just phone us up and be like, All right, guys, I'm here. What am I sciencing? <laughs> That's the idea. So you do that with your cameras. We've got two cameras on the top of the mast, like eyes, so you can see in 3D. So you look around you. By doing that, you can see what the depth perception is of all of the obstacles in front of you. Build up a 3D elevation map, like so. And then you can work out what is safe to drive over, what's a little bit sketchy, and what's really probably better not, and you characterize it into risk categories like that, and you calculate the risk and reward. So I want to go that way, and it's pretty safe that way, it's not so safe that way, that kind of thing. So you pick your path through in two meter sections, and eventually you get to your science target. That's the idea. So this, if it plays, <laughs> All right, so that's not going to work, but it is a little Mars rover trundling through. <laughs> I, I'm actually going to do this. I'm going to do this. So it trundles through, and then it stops, and it goes. <laughs> Did that rock just move? Which is actually it taking its three pictures, but it is really cute, trust me. So it kind of goes, trundle, 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 trundle. <laughs> trundle, 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 trundle. Did I leave the oven on? And that kind of thing. And eventually it gets to its science site. Ta-da! 